Well, the final presidential debate between Trump and Biden was earlier tonight. It was a far better debate than the train wreck of a debate that was the first debate. Kristen Welker was a much better moderator than Chris Wallace, although Trump still talked over her once in a while. I think she could have been a little bit more forceful, but whatever. You know, it was a better debate. It wasn't still that great, but it was better than the first one. There are some key issues that I wanted to address here, and the first one has to do with the reopening of schools. Let me follow up with you, President Trump. You've demanded schools open in person and insist they can do it safely. But just yesterday, Boston became the latest city to move its public school system entirely online after a coronavirus spike. What is your message to parents who worry that sending their children to school will endanger not only their kids, but also their teachers and families? Take note of her question. She's saying that there was a spike there and parents are worried about taking their kids to school. What advice does Trump have for them? I want to open the schools. Uh, The transmittal rate to the teachers is uh, very small. Is that supposed to be reassuring, coming from Trump? But I want to open the schools. We have to open our country. We're not going to have a country. You can't do this. We can't keep this country closed. This is a massive country with a massive economy. I could understand him saying this if he was talking about other businesses, but these are schools. And these can be done remotely. People are losing their jobs. They're committing suicide. There's depression, alcohol, drugs at a level that nobody's ever seen before. Those are good points, but not as a response to the question that he was asked. There's abuse, tremendous abuse. We have to open our country. You know, I've said it often. The cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. And that's what's happening. And he wants to close down. He'll close down the country if one person in our in our massive bureaucracy says we should close it down. Vice President Biden, your response. Simply not true. We ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We ought to be able to safely open. But would they need resources to open? You need to be able to, for example, if you're going to open a business, have social distancing within the business. You need to have, if you have a restaurant, you need to have plexiglass dividers so people cannot infect one another. You need to be in a position where you can take testing rapidly and know whether a person is, in fact, infected. You need to be able to trace. You need to be able to provide all the resources that are needed to do this. And that is not inconsistent with saying that what... We're going to make sure that we open safely. And by the way... And here's Biden saying what most people are probably thinking about what Trump said about teachers. All you teachers out there, not that many of you are going to die, so don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Come on. So now let's go into the subject of health care. Let's move on to American families and the economy. One of the issues that's most important to them is health care, as you both know. Today, there was a key vote on a new Supreme Court Justice, Amy Coney Barrett, and health care is at the center of her confirmation fight. Over 20 million Americans get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. It's headed to the Supreme Court, and your administration, Mr. President, is advocating for the court to overturn it. If the Supreme Court does overturn that law, those 20 million Americans could lose their their health insurance almost overnight. So what would you do if those people have their health insurance taken away? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Sure. Now, remember what she asked. What would you do if those people had their health insurance taken away? First of all, I've already done something that nobody thought was possible. Through the legislature, I terminated the individual mandate. That is the worst part of Obamacare, as we call it. The individual mandate where you have to pay a fortune for the privilege of not having to pay for bad health insurance. I terminate it. It's gone. What does that have to do with what she asked? Now, if you continue to watch, you'll notice that he just continues to try to weave around the question. Now it's in court because Obamacare is no good. But then I made a decision. Run it as well as you can to my people, great people. Run it as well as you can. I could have gone the other route and made everybody very unhappy. They ran it. Uh, Premiums are down. Everything's down. Here's the problem. No matter how well you run it, it's no good. What we'd like to do is terminate it. We have the individual mandate done. I don't know that it's going to work. If we don't win, we will have to run it and we'll have Obamacare, but it'll be better run. But it no longer is Obamacare because without the individual mandate, it's much different. 
See, he's still not answering the question. See, the thing is, he doesn't have any sort of plan. He's been in office this long, and he still doesn't have a plan. All he wants to do is destroy what was already established. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better, will always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new, beautiful health care. The Democrats will do it because there'll be tremendous pressure on them, and we might even have the House by that time, and I think we're going to win the House, okay? You'll see, but I think we're going to win the House. But come up with a better health care, always protecting people with pre-existing conditions. And one thing very important. See, Trump has no plan. His only plan is to get rid of Obamacare. And yet, throughout the debate, he hounds Biden for not being able to push some of the things that are in Biden's plan when he was vice president for Obama for eight years. We have 180 million people out there that have great private health care, far more than we're talking about with Obamacare. Joe Biden is going to terminate all of those policies. These are people that love their health care, people that have been successful, middle income people, been successful. They have 180 million plans, 180 million people, families. Under what he wants to do, which will basically be socialized medicine, he won't even have a choice. That's a lie. Biden doesn't have any sort of socialized medicine in his health care plan. I mean, that's why progressives were so pissed that Biden is the one that won the primaries. I mean, come on. They want to terminate 180 million plans. We have done an incredible job on health care, and we're going to do even better. Okay, Let Vice President Biden, yes, this is for you. Your health care plan calls for building on Obamacare. So my question is, what is your plan if the law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? You have two minutes uninterrupted. What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. It'll become Biden care. The public option is an option that says that if you, in fact, do not have the wherewithal to be, if you qualify for Medicaid and you do not have the wherewithal, in your state to get Medicaid, you automatically are enrolled, providing competition for insurance companies. That's what's going to happen. Secondly, we're going to make sure we reduce the premiums and reduce drug prices by making sure that there's competition that doesn't exist now by allowing the Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the insurance companies. Thirdly, the idea that I want to eliminate private insurance, the reason why I had such a fight for with 20 candidates for the nomination was, I support private insurance. That's why I didn't, not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. Lastly, we're going to make sure we're in a situation that we actually protect pre-existing. There's no way he can protect pre-existing conditions. None. Zero. You can't do it in the ether. He's been talking about this for a long time. There is no, he's never come up with a plan. I guess we're going to get the pre-existing condition plan the same time we get the infrastructure plan that we've been waiting for since 17, 18, 19, and 20. The fact, I still have a, little, a few more minutes. I know you're getting anxious. The, <laughs> the fact is that the, he's already cost the American people because of his terrible handling of the COVID virus and the economic spillover. 10 million people have lost their private insurance. And he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions. And all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions. What are they going to do? Now, I must admit, I'm pretty impressed with how Biden is carrying himself during this whole debate. He doesn't seem to be suffering from mental deterioration like I've seen in other interviews of him. You know, he's doing pretty good. Anyway, this next section is about race. Let's talk about our next section, which is race in America. And I want to talk about the way black and brown Americans experience race in this country. Part of that experience is something called the talk. It happens regardless of class and income. Parents who feel they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that they could be targeted, including by the police, for no reason other than the color of their skin. Mr. Vice President, in the next two minutes, I want you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? I do. I do. 
Now take note that he started by saying I do, and then he's going to continue on to give a better explanation. You know, my daughter is a social worker, and uh, she's, all, she's written a lot about this. She has a graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania in social work. And, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I ended up working on the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, which is 90 percent African-American, was to learn more about what was going on. What I didn't, I never had to tell my daughter if she's pulled over. Make sure she puts, for a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child. When you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street. Making sure that you, in fact, if you get pulled over, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, hands on top of the wheel because you are, in fact, the victim, whether you're a person making 300000 child of a $300,000 a year person or someone who's on, on, on food stamps. The fact of the matter is there is institutional racism in America. And we have always said We've never lived up to it. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. But guess what? We have never, ever lived up to it. But we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion, not exclusion. See, Biden is empathetic for what other people go through. This is the first president to come along and says, that's the end of that. We're not going to do that anymore. We have to provide for economic opportunity, better education, better health care, better access to schooling, better access to opportunity to borrow money to start businesses. All the things we can do, and I've laid out a clear plan as to how to do those things just to give people a shot. It's about accumulating the ability to have wealth as well as it is to be free from violence. President Trump, same question to you, and let me remind you of the question. I would like you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And that's all he's going to say about that. Now, you could claim that, uh, well, the question has already been answered, and he doesn't really need to go into it either, but this was an opportunity for Trump, and he didn't take it. And again... He's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing except in 1994 when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them super predators. And he said that, he said it, super predators. And they have never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. I'm not going to claim that Trump didn't do good things. He did. But to put them in the same category as the Emancipation Proclamation, I mean, come on. It's not even to the level of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He did good things, but come on, man. Criminal justice reform, Obama and Joe didn't do it. I don't even think they tried because they had no chance at doing it. They might have wanted to do it, but if you had to see the arms I had to twist to get that done, it was not a pretty picture. And everybody knows it, including some very liberal people that cried in my office. They cried in the Oval Office. Two weeks later, they're out saying, gee, we have to defeat him. Criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones with Tim Scott, a great senator from South Carolina, He came in with this incredible idea for Opportunity Zones. It's one of the most successful programs. People don't talk about it. Tremendous investment is being made. Biggest beneficiary, the black and Hispanic communities, and then historically black colleges and universities. After three years of coming to the office, I love some of those guys, they were great. They came into the office and they said, I said, what are you doing? After three years, I said, why do you keep coming back? because we have no funding. I said, you don't have to come back every year. We have to come back because President Obama would never give them long-term funding. And I did. 10-year long-term funding, and I gave them more money than they asked for because they said, I think you need more. And I said, the only bad part about this is I may never see you again because I got very friendly with them and they like me and I like them. But I saved it. Colleges and universities. Okay. Notice that they cut off his mic there at the very end. Also take note that Trump never addressed how black people often feel terrified of police officers. 
And we're going to talk about both of your records, but your response to that, Vice President. My response to that is I never, ever said what he accused me of saying. The fact of the matter is, in 2000, though, after the crime bill had been in, 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 in the law for a while, this is a guy who said the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. And go on my website, get the quote, the date, when he said it. Not enough people. I couldn't find that anywhere. Maybe it will eventually be on Biden's website, but, I mean, the layout of the website makes that really hard to find if it's even there. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who, in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime, of the crimes they were suggested. Trump may have done all those things, but as of so far, I haven't been able to find proof of it. I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I'm not saying he didn't do it, but... I haven't been able to find the proof. Look, and talk about he, granted, he did in fact let 20 people, he commuted 20 people sentences. We commuted over a thousand people sentences, over a thousand. Trump's smile right there reminded me of Roger Moore as James Bond at the end of the movie Moonraker, where they're floating while having sex. The very law he's talking about is a law that, in fact, initiated by Barack Obama. And secondly, we're in a situation here where we, the federal prison system was reduced by 38,000 people under our administration. And one of these things we should be doing, there should be no, no minimum ma mandatories in the law. That's why I'm offering $20 billion to states to change their state laws to eliminate minimum mandatories and set up drug courts. No one should be going to jail because they have a drug problem. They should be going to rehabilitation, not to jail. We should fundamentally change the system, and that's what I'm going to do. That honestly sounds like a really good plan, as far as I'm concerned. But why didn't he do it four years ago? Why didn't you do that four years ago, even less than that? Why didn't you I do it? You were vice president. You keep talking about all these things you're going to do, and you're going to do this. But you were there just a short time ago, and you guys did nothing. Well, Trump, it's probably for similar reasons as to why in four years you haven't done anything about infrastructure, and the only thing you've done about health care is try to tear down Obamacare. We did. You know, Joe, I, I ran because of you. I ran because of Barack Obama, because you did a poor job. If I thought you did a good job, I would have never run. Well, Trump, I mean, you were against Obama running in the first place. You were pushing the whole birther thing pushing that Obama's birth certificate was forged or something, right? That it's fake. Yeah, you couldn't stand Obama being president before he was even president. You know, that's why a lot of people think that you're racist. You couldn't stand a black man being president. That's what it feels like. So, you know, it seems that your whole presidency is trying to undo everything that Obama did, no matter how good it is. Uh, I would have never run. I ran because of you. I'm looking at you now. You're a politician. I ran because of you. All right, Vice President Biden, your response to that, and then I do have some uh, questions for both of you. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, I hope he does look at me because what's happening here is you know who I am. You know who he is. You know his character. You know my character. You know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. Biden, you don't have a very good record there, honestly. I mean, you've been caught lying a bunch of times, even lying about how well you did in college. I mean, dude, you don't have a good record there. You shouldn't have said that. Democratic presidential candidate Joseph Biden today faces a controversy. Three weeks ago at a debate at the Iowa State Fair, he used phrases identical to those delivered by British Labor Party leader Neil Kinnock. Biden seemed to be claiming Kinnock's vision and life as his own. Why is it that my wife is sitting out there in the audience is the first in her family to ever go to college? Why is Gladys the first woman in her family in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? My ancestors who worked in the coal mines in northeast Pennsylvania and come up after 12 hours and play football. Eight hours underground and then come up and play football. It's because they didn't have a platform upon which to stand. There was no platform 
upon which they could stand. The notion that every thought or notion or idea you'd have to go back and find and attribute to someone, I think is, quite frankly, uh, ludicrous. The problem here is that Senator Biden told his audience he'd just been thinking about these things, and he failed to give any credit at all to his famous British speechwriter. You know, I was thinking on the way over here. <laughs> now, that's a little too much, because, as you point out, what's behind the words? What's there? And a lot of people, a rap on Biden has always been, it's just a surface. I should have said, to paraphrase Neil Kinnock, it's the only time I didn't, in all the times I've ever used it. But CBS News found a tape of a second instance. It reappeared in the New York Times with a new charge that Biden had appropriated a famous litany from the late Robert Kennedy about what the gross national product cannot measure. It cannot measure the health of our children. The health of our children. The quality of our education. The quality of their education. The joy of their play. Or the joy of their play. Biden gave Kennedy no credit. He has also quoted or paraphrased John Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, and British Labor Party leader Neil Kinnock all without credit. Joseph Biden admitted today that he committed plagiarism when he was in law school. He said it was a mistake, but that it was unintentional. He quoted five pages of someone else's work without proper citation. I've done some dumb things, and I'll do dumb things again. He was given an F. So ladies and gentlemen, I've been dumb. To the political community in Washington, it all seems of a piece. Plagiarism at law school, plagiarism on the stump. The great communicator, strike that. The great imitator. You don't steal verbatim, uh, or when you do, as he did 99% of the time, you give credit. Biden's critics say he sells himself as a man whose words and visions can inspire a new generation in politics. But if the thoughts, phrases, and visions really belong to others, it's a form of false advertising. Is it a wise idea, though, to take something that personal, anyway, from another politician and try and appropriate it to your own campaign? I think it was a stupid thing to... Uh, appropriate uh, material that was really very personal that was someone else's. Most people didn't know who he was, you know, Joe Biden Biden, and now they're going to say, oh yeah, he's the guy who plagiarized. That's a lot of people. First. Politically, that's <laughs> devastating. These clips are devastating. He looks like a Joe Biden wind-up doll with somebody else's words coming out. If they're going to do things that are stupid as well as immoral, then they're probably too dumb to have the job of president. Voters are going to have to decide whether he was dishonest or dumb. Senator Joseph Biden may have more explaining to do. The new questions stem from With taped remarks of, of Biden States. during an April campaign appearance in New Hampshire. I went to law school on a full academic scholarship, the only one in my, in my class uh, to have a full academic scholarship. Went back to law school and in fact ended up in the top half of my class. I was the outstanding student in the political science department at the end of my year. I graduated with three degrees from undergraduate school and 165 credits, only 123 credits. Biden now concedes he did not graduate in the top half of his law school class, that he does not have three degrees from college, and that he was not named outstanding political science student in college. Newsweek says Biden actually went to school on a half scholarship, ended up near the bottom of his class, and won only one degree, not three. Joe Biden ranked 76th in a class of 85 at the University of Syracuse Law School. I mean, this guy comes off this whole thing as a flyweight. Now Biden says Newsweek is right. His memory had failed him. And I'd be delighted to sit down and compare my IQ to yours if you'd like, Frank. Joe Biden was victimized by the truth. Bye-bye, Biden. He may not know it yet, but I think this is very diff going to be very difficult for him to recover. Is Joe Biden dead meat, yes or no? I think so. Bob? Terminal condition. Terminal. Eleanor. Yes, unless he comes in third in Iowa. <laughs> Morton. Dying. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am, the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. Let me ask some follow-up. Excuse me. Please respond if and then we're going to have follow-up. this stuff is true questions. about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq, if this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. Right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody's hey, President calling Trump. Actually, there's a lot of people calling you corrupt, Joe. You can't say nobody's calling me that. No, there, there's plenty of people calling you that. Laptop I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of me. race. Take we're talking about the, the issue. Laptop from hell. President Trump, we're, we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Trump, and you've I have just... to respond to that. Please. Because look, Very there are 50 former national intelligence folks 
who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plan. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And you that's exactly what, is this that's where you're exactly going? what This is going. where he's going. The that, laptop right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia? I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President? again with Russia. Yeah, it is rather convenient, isn't it? We're going to continue on the issue of race. Mr. President, you've described the Black Lives Matter movement as a symbol of hate. You've shared a video of a man chanting white power to millions of your supporters. You've said that black professional athletes exercising their First Amendment rights should be fired. Yeah, I still don't understand how people can get so upset over people kneeling at a ball game. It doesn't make any sense to me. What do you say to Americans who say that kind of language from a president is contributing to a climate of hate and racial strife? Well, you have to understand and the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter, they were chanting pigs in a blanket, talking about police. Pigs, pigs, talking about our police. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I said, that's a horrible thing. And they were marching down the street. And that was my first uh, glimpse of Black Lives Matter. I thought it was a terrible thing. As far as uh, my relationships with all people, I think I have great relationships with all people. I am the least racist person in this room. <laughs> well, what do you say to Americans who are concerned by that rhetoric? I, I don't know. The, I mean, I don't videos. know what to say. I got criminal justice reform done and prison reform and opportunity zones. I took care of black colleges and universities. I don't know what to say. They can say anything. I mean, they can say anything. It's a very, it makes me sad because I am, I, I am the least racist person i can't even see the audience because it's so dark what's the importance of looking at the audience can you tell someone is racist just by looking at them but i don't care who's in the audience i'm the least racist person in this room okay vice president biden abraham. let me ask you very quickly and then i have a follow-up question for you abraham lincoln here is one of the most racist presidents we've had in modern history what he pours fuel on every single racist fire well, he does kind of do that, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Every single one. Started off his campaign coming down the escalator saying he's going to get rid of those Mexican rapists. He's banned Muslims because they're Muslims. Islam is not a race. Muslims are not a race. He has moved around and made everything worse across the board. He says to the, about the poor boys. Proud boys. Last time we were on stage here, he said, I told him to stand down and stand ready. Come on. This guy is a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. President Trump, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to respond, and then I have a follow-up. You know, you made a reference to Abraham Lincoln. Where did that come in? I mean, you said you're Abraham that, Lincoln. No, no, where did that? No, no. You said, I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody right. done what I've done for the black community. And I'm saying, I didn't say I'm Abraham Lincoln. I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody done what I've done for the black community. Now, you have done nothing other than the crime bill which put oh God. Th tens of thousands of black men mostly in jail. All right, let me, you know let, what? Me let me they ask They remember Vice it President because Biden if you look at what's happening with the voting right now, let me ask they Vice remember President that Biden you treated them very, very badly. The, Just the, take a look at what's happening out there. Vice President Biden, let me give you a chance to respond within this context. Crime okay. bills that you supported in the 80s and 90s contributed to the incarceration of tens of thousands of young black men who had small amounts of drugs in their possession. They are sons, they are brothers, they're fathers, they're uncles, whose families are still to this day, some of them suffering the consequences. So speak to those families. Why should they vote for you? One of the things is that in the 80s, we passed 100%, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense and particularly the portion on cocaine. Now there's something that Trump could never do. Admit that he's wrong. Admit that he made a mistake. And I gotta give props to Biden for that.
That's why I've been arguing that, in fact, we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. That's what we should be spending money on. That's why I set up drug courts, which were never funded by our Republican friends. They should not be going to jail for a drug or an alcohol problem. They should be going into treatment, treatment. That's what we've been trying to do. That's what I'm going to get done because I think maybe the American people have now seen that, in fact, it was a mistake to pass those laws relating to the drug. But they were not in the crime bill. But okay. why didn't he get it done? See, it's all talk, no action with these politicians. Why didn't he get it done? That's what I'm going to do when I become president. You were vice president along with Obama as your president, your leader, for eight years. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years to get it done. Now you're saying you're going to get it done because you're all talk and no action, Jim. We got your a lot response. of it done. We released 38,000 38, prisoners left from the... You got out, nothing done. 38,000 prisoners were released from federal prison. We have... There were over 1,000 people who were given clemency. We have made, In fact, we're the ones that put in the legislation saying we could look at pattern and practice of police departments and what they were doing, how they were conducting themselves. I could go on, but we began the process. We began the process. We lost an election. That's why... I I'm running to win back that election and change his terrible policy. I just With asked, I just asked on one question. Why didn't you do it in the eight years, a short time ago? Why didn't you do it? You just said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. You put tens because of thousands of mostly black young men in prison. Now you're saying you're going to get, you're going to undo that. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years with Obama. Because you know why, Joe? Because you're all talk and no action. Well, Trump, why haven't you come up with a health care plan? Why haven't you done anything significant about the infrastructure? President Trump, people of color are much more likely to live near oil refineries and chemical plants. In Texas, there are families who worry the plants near them are making them sick. Your administration has rolled back regulations on these kinds of facilities. Why should these families give you another four years in office? Uh, the families that we're talking about are employed heavily, and they're making a lot of money, more money than they've ever made. She didn't ask how much money they make. What difference does that make? If you look at the kind of numbers that we produce for Hispanic, for Black, for Asian, it's nine times greater the percentage gain than it was under, in three years, than it was under eight years of the two of them, to put it nicely. Nine times more. Now, Somebody lives, I have not heard the numbers or the statistics that you're saying, but they're making a tremendous amount of money economically. We saved it. And I saved it again a number of months ago when oil was crashing because of the pandemic. Okay. We saved it. We got, say what you want about relationship, we got Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Russia to cut back way back. We saved our oil industry, and now it's very vibrant again. Right. And everybody has very inexpensive gasoline. Remember Vice that. President Biden, your response, and then we're going to have a final question for both of you. My response is that those people live on what they call fence lines. He doesn't understand this. They live live near chemical plants that in fact pollute chemical plants and oil plants and refineries that pollute. I used to live near that when I was growing up in Claymont, Delaware. And all the more oil refineries in Marcus Hook and the Delaware River than there is any place, including in Houston at the time. When my mom get in the car and when, when there were first frost to drive me to school, turn in the windshield, whatever, there'd be oil slick in the window. That's why so many people in my state were dying and getting cancer. The fact is those frontline communities, it doesn't matter what you're paying them. It matters how you keep them safe. What do you do? And you impose restrictions on the pollutions that it, the pollutants coming out of those fence line communities. I got to say that was well said, Biden. Okay, I have one final would question. Would he close it down falls, the oil industry? It falls. W would you close it down falls. the oil industry? By the way, I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I would that's transition. a big statement. That's it is a big statement. That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because the oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh, I see. Here's the deal. But that's you can't a big do statement. That. Well, if you let me finish the statement, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time over time, and I'd stop giving to the oil industry, I'd stop giving them federal subsidies. 
He won't give federal subsidies to the to the gas. Excuse me, to the to uh, solar and wind. Yeah. Why are we giving it to oil industry? We actually do All give right. it to solar and wind. We and have that's one maybe final the biggest question. statement in terms of business. That's the biggest statement. Okay. Because basically what he's saying question, is he is Mr. going President. to destroy the oil industry. Well, Trump, I mean, we have to make some changes. We can't keep doing things the same way we've been. You didn't even want to admit there's a pollution problem. Oh, they're getting paid more. Yeah, whatever, dude. You know? So this is, you know, Trump on the environment is is crap. You know, it's it's one of the many things that suck about him. Okay. Will you remember that, Texas? Will you okay. remember that, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma? Vice President Biden, let me give you 10 seconds to respond, Ohio. and then I have to get to the final question. Vice President Biden. He takes everything out of context, but the point is, look, we have to move toward a net zero emissions. The first place to do that by the year 2035 is in energy okay. production. By 2050, totally. Anyway, um, those were the highlights of the debate that I thought were well worth looking at. So thanks for watching.